Hey guys, it's So From Zoe's Real Thoughts. I'm here with Kristen from Sales on Film, and we're here to review David Zellner's Kimiko the Treasure Hunter. Right. Um, this movie came out a couple months ago. Yeah. I actually saw it last year uh, for Sundance's Next Fest, mm-hmm. and nobody heard about it, didn't even know about it. Uh, I only went because I heard that Werner Herzog, Werner Herzog was going to moderate the Q&A, and I went literally for him. Like, uh-huh. I didn't really go for the movie at all um, uh-huh. but I was pl- like I went in thinking that I wouldn't be very interested and then I came out uh, kind of mesmerized mm-hmm. being I was kind of I think the sort of like the net effect of watching this movie is maybe like pu- like m- mesmerized puzzlement or sort of like baffled like what happened or what did I just watch not that it's like purposefully confusing But it's very, very deliberately sort of narrow in its scope and um, doesn't um, engage in a lot of different levels and the storyline is very straight ahead. So I guess we should talk about what it's about. Yeah. So it's about, it's based on a true story or inspired by a true story about this girl in Japan who reads that, um, she becomes obsessed with the movie Fargo. Uh, and thinks that there's a treasure hidden in well, Michigan. That's actually not true. I mean, the re- I, it, this happened uh, uh, in 2001. Okay. So about 50, 15 years ago, this uh, Asian tourist <laughs> was found dead um, in, I guess, uh, somewhere in Michigan, a yeah. uh, Great Lake area. And uh, there was an urban legend that was sort of perpetuated by the media that she had traveled to this area to find the money that Steve Buscemi's character buries in Fargo, not understanding that Fargo is a fictional story, because if you've seen Fargo, you know at the beginning there's a little tag that says this is based on a true story. The Coen brothers just made that up. So the... the, the, That's hilarious. the, The urban legend around this woman's death is that she didn't understand that it wasn't true and went to look for it and then passed away, either died or whatever. Now, what actually happened is has nothing to do with that. She uh, was uh, fired from her job in Japan, had been depressed, um, had previously traveled to the Fargo or Minnesota area before with uh, an American businessman who was married and she was having an affair with. So she was familiar with the area. And she went there basically to, uh, for some reason that's unknown, uh, but she, you know, uh, took an overdose of alcohol and pills and, uh, and killed herself. And that's what happened in real life. Now this movie, the Zellner Brothers movie, is not based on the actual Inspired. facts the actual facts of the event it's based on the urban legend that grew out of that real event so there are some sort of confusing layers of fiction and reality and metafiction and the interaction between um uh, you know art and uh, people's self-expression because this film sort of presents uh kimiko who is uh, played by rinko kikuchi as a treasure hunter herself, uh, even before she travels to, yeah. to Fargo, as a person who likes to have adventures, to make maps and look for things, and her own life in, in Tokyo is extremely boring. She works at a company where she has to wear a uniform, and she's just like one of the girls in the office, and she doesn't like it, and it's very, it's very um, monochromatic and uniform, so she tries to find these... Uh, these little adventures or these little puzzles to make for herself. And I guess, you know, uh, she decides, which she does in the movie, become obsessed with uh, Fargo and uh, watches a VHS copy of it and, you know, maps out in the movie where the treasure is. And then she does eventually in the movie come to the United States. But it takes about an hour in the movie of So her. why didn't you? Why didn't I like it? It's, yeah, I guess one of the reasons is that it does take so much time focusing on her life in Tokyo, about an hour, um, but it really conveys her emotional headspace and her life and her plan within about 20 minutes. Um, so it's very, very, the first half of the movie is extremely drawn out. 
and the the way that the Zona brothers are sort of representing her um, her social isolation and her a very closeted life are sort of uh, very t- stereotypical. Like there's a shot of her sort of like on an ele- on an escalator downstairs and she's like a single figure within, you know, so- sort of an urban, an, a- a- an overwhelming urban landscape. But all of these things are very, very, um, I guess, well-worn visual signifiers that she's lonely. And it, at, at a certain point it just becomes repetitive and obvious. Um, and then she finally gets, you know, travels to the U.S. And I think it, it just created so much thing. anticipation. Like, you get to well, see her, yeah. the world that she's, like, basically living in and encompassed. And she she really needs to, like, get out. And this yeah. was, like, her outlet to finally, you know, do bigger, better things. Yeah, it's, and it's interesting, too, that when she finally does get to America, she does not know she's just as ill-equipped to go on this adventure as she is to navigate her regular life in Tokyo because she she steals her boss's credit card to finance the trip the credit card is canceled while she's there so she ends up not having any money she doesn't speak enough English and she doesn't actually know how to get to the place where she's going I think she was a very interesting character because she is it's not that uh, she's just illusional and and she's this like depressed uh, kind of there's a lot of psych psychological things that are going on within Mm -hmm. and I I think I what I appreciated was kind of how it wasn't uh, very climactic and it kind of went on this like very long journey of her and then it it just fills this space with um, like surrealism and it becomes very mystic, and it kind of makes this uh, fable it, even that much bigger. And um, it comes to like a deafening point at the cl- like the end, where it's very like fantasy. It, mm-hmm. They're in this like fantasy yeah, world. Yeah, it becomes um, increasingly surreal. For yeah, sure. and I think that's what, what was the most surprising part was just how um, engaged I became with the story and how invested and how atmospheric it was it really takes you into this space uh, and it, it's kind of thrilling and scary and um, yeah I mean very I, I, mystical I know I know what you're saying and I, the film does ha- have a very sort of like a mystical metaphysical almost like non-physical uh, relationship to the Settings, especially to the like uh, snow-covered uh, yeah. settings. Uh, I think that the point that we can agree on is that Rinko Kikuchi's performance is uh, very, very, very strong, and a very interesting take on a character because she's a character who's almost entirely closed off. Yeah. Not only to the other characters in the movie, of which there are very few. It's mostly just her on it's screen her. for the entirety of the runtime. But it's like her performance is closed off to those characters. It's also closed off to us. And she's conveying almost entirely the interiority of this character just with her facial expressions. Her facial expressions, also her, the you know the way that she walks, her physical bearing. Um, and it's just there's just so much because that she she conveys just by like her presence, and I feel like that's really hard to do, especially if yeah. you're on the screen by yourself the entire time. Yeah, and I, I mean, I, absolutely, I think her performance should be praised. I think the problem that I have with the, with the film as a whole is that. Um, really the, the filmmakers hang most, almost the entirety of the movie on her performance and don't really give her very much to play off of yeah. or anything outside of her performance. So even though there are these interesting things that are going on, um, you know, sort of with the townspeople that she meets, the, uh, this old widow and a, a policeman, it's still, like, she's still it, it, very closed yeah. off and it, 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 it presents sort of a... Uh, I wanted to impen- see her shine yeah. more a little bit, kind of it's show sort of a little like, bit more range, yeah. and it's sort of like impenetrable. Like they're trying to uh, convey an impenetrable and an obtuse uh, attitude, you know. But I of, think that that's how she is, you know. It is, but it's like at a, at a certain point, it, it becomes a little, it becomes a little suffocating because you're you're just constantly with her, but then you know because you know watching it from the beginning that it's not going to end well and she's not the kind of person that is going to succeed in her quest and at a certain point I had a little faith I had a little faith really okay yeah well I don't know I mean it seemed like she was just very 
like delusional or unwell or yeah. not in a good headspace from the beginning. So it was like once, like you said, the movie starts to get sort of more fanciful and fin spinning a fairy tale. To me, those tones don't mix very well because they're, at the center of this movie, there's someone who is very obviously unwell. Yeah. But the filmmakers are treating it in such a way that's almost it's almost like magical. Like her illness or her delusion is something that creates a fantasy that is like almost an aspirational fantasy or a way to sort of like free herself. And to me, I, that it comes across as a little maybe intellectually or morally suspect because I don't think that that is a good way or a mm. uh, instructive way of sort of dealing with somebody, especially someone, a character that is based in part on a real person to sort of say like, oh, okay, like it's fine that she turned, you know, her um, suicidal depression into a sort of magical quest. I think that was the, like, the most appealing part because they didn't make it that, didn't, she didn't, become this figure of like um like I, I don't feel sorry for her and I like that that they turned her illness into something that is a little bit more like lighthearted and a little bit more magical and kind of not like I want to be her aspirational wise but it just created her to be this very um very interesting and unique character uh, that I I, I really mean, enjoyed just watching I, I, even though yeah. I I had nothing in common with her. I couldn't relate at all. Yeah. But just watching her and having the story unravel, especially in this kind of space, uh, I thought it was a very unique experience. I, yeah, I understand what you're saying to a certain extent is that I think the determination in Rikukuchi's performance really comes through. And that's what makes Kumiko like a an interesting character to watch because she is so single-minded. So yeah. you are sort of rooting for her. But like I said, it's I, I think may, maybe this, uh, my problem comes in mostly with the ending which I won't, I guess I won't get into details because it is a spoiler for the ending, but the way that it ends, sort of to me, it undercuts some of the uh, realism or the emotional honesty of the film. I think I liked the ending because it was, it, it reached a point of like the ultimate kind of fantasy. Okay. And surrealism. So you bought into the fantasy aspect Yeah, because it. It, it, it turned this... The fable increasingly became more real, real, and um, it just became such a magical like mm -hmm. place to be, where you're not sure what really happened, but does it really matter? Um, and I really found myself liking it more than I thought I would ever like something. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, I think it's mostly the experience that I felt rather than the content. Okay. Like how I feel. So it like after lulled you out into of, a certain way of feeling about it yeah i think okay. it, for me it was like i was more emotionally moved more than anything okay. this was more like a feeling movie where i i didn't think that i would feel that way watching a film and then i came out I'm like wow that was a very interesting and kind of paralyzing uh experience right so it was like less rewarding intellectually and more rewarding because it transported it transported yeah. you emotionally someplace that you weren't expecting to go yeah Okay. It transported me to boredom. So. <laughs> okay. I can see the board. Like, yeah. I think it, it treads on that. Yeah. And it becomes either it goes or... I yeah, think I, I, think, I, think I think you sort on. of are able, depending on the viewer, to either buy into the viewpoint they're having on this story. You're either going to buy into the fable aspect of it and buy into the fact that it's okay to spin this story as something that might be metaphysical as opposed to real. Yeah. Or it's going to rub you the wrong way as it did with me. But, you know, I think it's, uh, maybe, it, I think it's worth it to see it for Rinko Especially for performance. The, yeah, and I, I think that watching it in theaters is vital. I think that being encompassed in that, uh, that environment was very important for me. Just okay. as an experience. Uh -huh. Um, so yeah. Alrighty. Well, that was, uh, wow, we, we just went through so many. Um, that was our last, this is our last uh, installment of Love It or Hate It. And for be now. sure to follow, yeah, for sure. Be sure to follow Kristen on her blog. Um, yeah, it's salesonfilm.tumblr.com and at salesonfilm on Twitter. And let us know what you guys thought about uh, all the films that we talked about, including this one. And maybe we'll check you guys out later. Bye. Bye.